So we've had the Jetcraft perspective on the market. And what we wanted to do is look outside business aviation, not be as myopic. And we're absolutely delighted to have our next speaker. I've seen him uh, at other events or another event. And I can tell you, Nick Allen from Control Risks, who's president of Europe, Middle East, and Africa, is the guy you want on your pub quiz team. He can answer questions about any country in the world. And I'd encourage you to do that after his presentation. Is that what you wanted me to say, Nick? Yeah, no, thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Alistair. Is, is the mic working? The mic's working. So uh, get ready for glass uh, half empty, um, I'm afraid. You're all, uh, by and large, in the business aviation world, so I expect that all of you are aware that the world is round. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second. 2018 is going to be marked by conflict. Uh, the good news, if you're not involved in the areas of conflict, is that by and large it will be localized and it probably won't spread beyond where it's, where it's happening. Um, so why did I say that the world is round? Well, obviously the world is round. Um, sitting here in Europe, a lot of us think um, that the world works left to right and the United Kingdom sits in the middle. So one of the top risks I am going to talk about is North Korea and escalation. So why is the world round? Well, actually, Lowestoft in East Anglia, those of you who know where it is, is 5,276 miles from Pyongyang. We worry about escalation in North Korea and North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles hitting the western seaboard of the United States. Now, Seattle is 5,300 miles uh, from Pyongyang. So, Lowestoft, and I apologize if anyone has a, has a house there, is some uh, 24 miles closer to Pyongyang than Seattle. So, that is why NATO, why Western countries, including North American countries, worry about um, escalation in North Korea. I'm not predicting a nuclear war for 2018. That would sort of take the edge off Chad's presentation, I think. Um, <laughs> But what I am saying is that this is a risk that we need to be cognizant of because Kim Jong-un isn't going anywhere. There's nothing in North Korea that suggests that we're going to see any uh, change in that regime now. The Chinese are not going to intervene, sort this out. Um, in 2018, North Korea will launch an ICBM. They kind of have to. If you're North Korea, Kim, Kim Jong-un isn't, isn't a deranged madman. He's highly rational. He's seen the fate of uh, Colonel Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein. Um, the lesson from there is, is if you get rid of your weapons, uh, change comes, and it doesn't come in a pleasant way uh, if you're the leader of North Korea. So he has to launch a missile. And despite the, the good positive news about the Winter Olympics and you know, shared teams and one flag, um, this is a risk because it's very easy to see the path to escalation and if you talk to security sources in Europe, um, they are deeply concerned about having a state that has both capability and intent that is capable of hitting, if we just talk about Europe, Western Europe, with these missiles. So this is a risk, I think, that we need to be cognizant of and watch those escalation triggers. The second thing I want to talk about is cyber attacks uh, in 2018. I'm going to talk about it from two, two different angles. So 2017 um, was the year of uh, sort of big, sort of slightly random cyber, cyber attacks. For those of you who were running uh, bootleg Microsoft uh, software in your companies, you probably suffered uh, from the WannaCry virus because that's who it hit most. That was clearly attributed now to North Korea, which was out raising money. Um, North Korea needs hard currency. Um, some of you will recall the attack on the Central Bank of Bangladesh when they stole $80 million. Um, those of you in the UK will have heard um, Gavin Williamson, who's the, the Secretary of State for Defense in the UK, making some unhelpful remarks, in my view, um, about Russian uh, capability and intent in the cyber world. We believe that 2018 is going to see much more targeted attacks on infrastructure, SCADA systems, operating systems than we've seen in 2017. Um, there are some, probably 20 or so governments around the world that have good offensive cyber capability, the United Kingdom being one, obviously the United States, Russia, China, Israel, etc. Um, we're not heading for cyber war, but you have seen, we saw uh, 
leakage is probably the best word from uh, NSA tools into the criminal world. There are links in certain countries between highly sophisticated criminal cyber attackers and states. So 2018 is the year where we believe we're going to see many more uh, targeted cyber attacks. The other thing that's going on in the world of cyber, and I'm sure as companies you're aware of this, is lots of data regulation. Countries trying to get their hands around what this new world means. Um, and you've seen China's um, cybersecurity law, you've seen new laws in Australia, you've seen famously here in the EU now, GDPR, coming in, get that wrong, they could fine you 4% of your overall global revenue, it's quite a big fine. A lot of companies are distracted at the moment by that, understandably so, um, and distracted from really thinking about what the threat to them is in the cyber world, because we believe this year um, we're going to see uh, many more targeted attacks. The third thing I want to talk about, and in many ways this um, affects uh, your industry more than, the, than others, because you rely on, well, lots of industries rely on, I guess, on economic growth. Um, I imagine those croissants at the uh, Bombardier breakfast this morning were that little bit bigger um, <coughs> than they might have been had that trade decision gone the other way in their dispute with Boeing. <coughs> and it'd be a braver man than me that takes that on on stage here. Um, but protectionist trade policies, the, US, uh, the current US president and his administration and uh, Secretary of State for Commerce have consistently um, been clear that they believe that the current trade system does not work in the US uh, national interest. And obviously the United States remains um, the largest economy in the world and its support for global trade is hugely important. Um, when uh, President Trump was meeting Alistair at Davos, he also found time to make a speech. Um, and he said quite clearly, you know, it's America first, but we're open for business and people like that. But we've also seen some quite clear protectionist policies. We saw that on um, solar panels uh, just recently and washing machines largely affecting uh, China and South Korean import, imports. Those countries uh, haven't reacted yet. Um, the decision in favor of Bombardier on Friday obviously went against what most people were expecting. It is quite possible to see, particularly 2018, we have elections in the United States, more protectionist policies uh, coming in. You have also elections in Mexico if Andres Manuel López Obrador were to become president, a sort of Mexican nationalist, you could see really NAFTA un un unraveling quite quickly. Um, so protectionism, I think, is a key risk uh, to that buoyant mood around the global economy. economy. And the, and it, let's be clear, if you're, if you're a Democrat candidate in 2020 to win the US presidency, which obviously they want to do, um, you need to reclaim um, the middle of the United States, those kind of working class towns, and you're, you're not going to do that with your liberal metropolitan elite agenda. So we expect that the, the Democrat positions have become much more protectionist as well if they're going to win over that vote. And obviously, uh, President Trump running for a second time, he has been very consistent um, in his base uh, and, and sticking to what he talked about in his election campaign. So we view that as a, as a key risk. Um, more happy news, uh, big power rivalry in the Middle East. Well, um, what we're seeing currently in the Middle East now is a uh, proxy war, really, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. We're not expecting all-out war in the Middle East uh, between those two big powers. It would be devastating if it, if it did happen. But um, we are expecting this proxy war to carry on. We expect it to get worse. You're seeing that played out, obviously, in Yemen. You're seeing it in Syria. You're seeing it in... Uh, Iraq, Iraq now very clearly a sort of ally of Iran, and the continued strengthening of Hezbollah um, in Lebanon and its capability to attack Israel. So for the Middle East, we expect, unfortunately, more of that. Uh, the arrival of, of Turkey into northern Syria to attack that uh, sort of um, Kurdish enclave there, unhelpful you have. We don't think it's likely, but you have the potential of two NATO powers. Uh, Turkey and US actually and other forces on the ground supporting the Kurds there actually fighting each other. We think that's unlikely. We think Turkey will hold back from that. Um, but the Middle East remains, I'm sad to say, um, an area of, of, of conflict. And the challenge with conflict, obviously, is it can have unexpected repercussions. The fifth thing, and I think uh, a drive that we've seen um, or a change we've seen in the last sort of four or five years is personalized leadership around the world. So whether that is uh, you know, 
President Putin in Russia, whether it's you know, the arrival of Xi Jinping thought up there with Deng Xiaoping and Chairman Mao in China, um, whether it is President Trump, whether it's here in, in France, it's uh, um, Emmanuel Macron, um, that personalized leadership, um, you see it Duterte in the Philippines, Erdogan in Turkey. Um, there was a brief attempt in the UK, those of you who live here, for, for Prime Minister May to have a sort of personalized campaign. It, it lasted a couple of weeks. Um, didn't really go anywhere. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because, in our view, personalized leaders, leadership often tends to be more populist in nature, and there's been a, a huge rise in populism as a sort of underlying um, risk around the world. If you consider um, Emmanuel Macron, you know, sort of savior of the free world, um, in, his, in his presidential election, 35%, just under 35% of France voted uh, for a fascist far-right candidate. That is an extraordinary shift, particularly if you think when Chirac, who was old, tired, corrupt, I'm not saying anything that is uh, slanderous, all of this is true, um, managed to win 85% of the presidency. So there's been a shift in a country like, like France, um, and that's a concern. So we worry about this because personalized leadership tends to be uh, much more short-term, people take short-term decisions, um, and sometimes ego gets in the way of sensible policies. So those are our five risks. I'll talk about a couple more things now. Um, this being the aviation industry, um, you will be, uh, I'm afraid to say, like all of us, concerned around terrorism. And I'm going to just give you our, our brief thoughts on, on terrorism and, and how we see that for the year ahead. If you look at these um, slides here, well, two slides. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There's been a profound increase um, in terrorism and countries being affected by terrorism ar around the world. A lot of this driven by um, Islamist-inspired terrorism. Worth remembering that there are all sorts of terrorists out there. There isn't just in the media, there's a, a big focus, particularly in Western countries, around Islamist-inspired, but there are right-wing, there are left-wing terrorists, there are nationalist terrorists, etc. We've seen a big increase, and um, we expect the momentum behind this, unfortunately, to carry on, and there are reasons for that. Um, here in Europe, you see the slide of who's gone to fight in Syria. More foreign fighters went to fight in Syria um, than all the other um, Islamist-inspired campaigns put together, whether that be sort of Chechnya or Afghanistan. And some of them have been killed, and some of them are coming home. And you can see, unsurprisingly, France with the greatest number, then Germany and the UK with, with a significant number also being the larger countries in Europe. Some, I guess, outliers, uh, Denmark um, per head of population, I think, having the highest number. So why does it matter? Well, I think Islamist-inspired terrorism, so transnational terrorism, which is what I think we're really concerned around, um, is split into two camps. You have um, both uh, Isla so-called Islamic State and Al-Qaeda have been very successful at using modern tools to inspire direct, very cheap, easy attacks like we saw um, in London, like we saw in Berlin, etc., we're all familiar with those. Um, foreign fighters come back, they bring networks, they bring skills, they bring motivation. Not all of them, um, some of them uh, just will, will go back to living peacefully. Aviation, unfortunately, remains a hugely attractive, attractive target for terrorists. Um, it's high impact, whether that's airports or, or aircraft, we're really in the, I guess, the, the passenger um, area. So, as I'm sure you're aware, security services around the world constantly interrupting plots. It is a thin line that prevents success, and I guess we remain concerned around terrorism because it has a disproportionate impact on confidence, on, on economies, uh, that's why people do it. So, with two minutes left, I just thought I'd pause and have a look at sort of what's really driving political risk um, at the moment, and I've got five things here I want to talk about. The, um, the slide there on the percentile of global economic distribution. So I would say that the biggest um, event that has shaped the global security environment in the last 20 years is not 9-11 in New York, but it's the global financial crisis um, because that has fundamentally changed how lots of populations look at capitalism and democracy and whether it works for them. Who won in the era of, of unfettered globalization? Well, Asia got rich, and, and that's great, um, and it got um, uh, a, a middle class grew. Who didn't win? Well, um, working middle class uh, developed economies, those people didn't win. Um, and some of your clients, um, 
the top 1%, they did really well out of it, and it sounds like they're doing even better. That leaves, the problem is that that leaves populations feeling uh, frustrated and they see other people getting rich, whether it be foreigners as they look outside their country and that leads to concerns over immigration and foreign aid and those kind of things and the very wealthy getting rich too. So I think from a security perspective, why does it matter? Well, everything I've talked around in terms of populism and that kind of leadership stems from that. The picture there of the United Nations. Um, I was at a talk uh, uh, recently from a former head of the um, CIA and NSA and he was saying things that we thought were fixed are not quite as fixed as we thought. So a lot of us, like myself, have grown up used to the global institutions, whether that be the United Nations, the World Bank, um, the World Trade Organization, the European Union, sort of fixed and permanent in place. Well, there are lots of reasons to think that these, these institutions are being picked apart because they depend, they're consensus driven, and they depend on uh, the support of the most important country, which is the United States, um, abiding and supporting those rules, and other countries as well, who look to that for a lead. So some of these things are not as fixed as we thought. One of the problems that elites then have with democracy, and this is why I have a picture of tax in Shinawat, is because if you look at Thailand, every time they have an election, election tax in Shinawat wins, or his sister wins, or someone linked to him wins. So that's why Thailand has given up on dem democracy for the moment, because the people who run Thailand feel that every time they have an election, it's not going to work in their interest. So I think democracy in many countries is actually seriously under attack. The workers holding up their laptops. Um, I think lots of democratic countries haven't really worked out what to do about social media, about digitalization, and how it um, affects the democratic process. Famous companies like Cambridge Analytica that works on the Trump campaign, the Leave campaign here on Kenyatta's campaign in Kenya. Um, Micro-targeting, and in an era of fake news, and in an era where lots of us get news from sources that we agree with, I think what is actually true and what is fact is also seriously under attack, and that's not positive. And the last one, I'm running out of time, some of you, I hope, will have read this with FT Magazine, The End of the Trucker. So what does artificial intelligence, what does increased automation, um, what does increased robotics mean for workers, whether that be in developed countries or whether that be in a continent like Africa, huge growth in population. Previously, their, their sort of source out of, out of poverty has been having big young populations that can be put to work. As technology impacts economies, we don't yet know what that's going to mean. I don't have a, a totally doomsday view of the world, um, but these are things that are really shaping politics and how politicians use these uh, to drive their own agendas. Um, online at Control Risk, there's our risk map publication. We've just published it. You can go on there and look around if you're interested. So there is obviously huge economic positivity uh, globally at the moment, and, and obviously in this sector as well. Um, but there are reasons why that positivity could possibly derail a little bit in 2018. I hope it doesn't. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. There's nothing like the feeling of optimism draining out the room. <laughs> uh, as someone from Suffolk, I can just reassure people in the room that Provided you could get the people out, uh, a major nuclear attack could cause millions of pounds of improvement to Lowestoft. Um, we've got six questions on Slido, if we can put that up. Um, one of them I'm going to answer, which is, what's the password for London 2018 Wi-Fi? <laughs> and it's London 18, uh, with a capital L. Okay, any questions in the room? Um, I'm going to put a poll up as well, Nick, so we can see how you've managed to completely take everyone's happiness away. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. It's what we brought you here for. Um, interesting question here. Assuming North Korea is a rational actor, um, it must know it is finished if it were to launch a we weapon of mass destruction. You disagree? With no, that I question. don't disagree. So, yes, obviously, if it launches a nuclear attack against any one of its neighbours or the United States, that's the end of it. But it's going to launch. It is going to prove that it has an ICBM capability. So it will launch an ICBM missile over Japan. 
Um, and it will, it, it needs to make the point that it has this capability because that, I mean, nuclear deterrence, those of us who, who studied international relations in the early 90s will, you know, recall it is about mutually assured destruction. So the North Koreans need to make the point that even if only one of their missiles could hit Seattle, um, that's probably an unacceptable loss to North America and her allies, the United States. Okay, here's a glass half full question. Do you see extra opportunities for private aviation due to the unstable geopolitical picture? You know, one of the arguments for private aviation is you're not flying from the passenger terminal. This is, I think, you know, Patrick's being really cheery here, but do you see this as a... Yeah, so, I mean, you know, private aviation, you're largely ferry ferrying sort of business people and very rich people around the world. So, um, I, I recall, I don't know if this is correct, but I recall that used to live as a kid in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and there's a booming market for helicopters, has been, because the security situation is so bad. So yeah, all the, everything I've talked about might be, might be fantastic for many people in this room. Um, <laughs> sort of counterintuitive. Yeah, and then um, let's stick with LATAM. Uh, will the Venezuela situation destabilize the whole region? Um, I don't think it will destabilize Latin America. I think Venezuela, unfortunately, will carry on um, as it has been. Um, Maduro still has the support of the army, um, and as, as, as a consequence of that, they have, you know, interests in, in many different businesses. Um, there will be elections this year. He will entirely run the process. The opposition is still strangely fragmented in Venezuela, so Venezuela remains um, a, a real uh, basket case, I guess, in, in many ways, certainly um, e economically. But I think 2018 isn't the year we're going to see any change in Venezuela. Okay, we have a question from Lunar Jets. We, again, like Brexit, Bitcoin has come up. Uh, are Bitcoins a huge risk to the global economy? They're not a huge risk to the global economy because the, the, just the, the sheer volume of Bitcoin is, is not big enough to be a risk to the global economy. Um, I'm not qualified to give you investment advice on whether you should be buying Bitcoin. Um, is that because you're pushing Ethereum? <laughs> they've also fallen as well. I think it, you know, we're in the early stages of cryptocurrency and what it means. The problem that Bitcoin has is it's hugely helpful for criminals to move money around the world. And central banks and criminal uh, and police forces, etc., have spotted that. And so you're seeing a big clamp down on Bitcoin. Okay, it's taken almost 30 minutes before Slido has started being abused. Um, who's got the bigger red button? And shouldn't we, let's combine this in one question. Bear in mind, we have a lot of Americans in the room. Should we be more worried about Trump launching a missile than North Korea? Who's got the biggest button? Look, who's got the biggest button in the United States has, the, and it has a, a button that's you know, enormously large compared to the North Koreans. But they only need to be able to get one missile through, don't they? I mean, that, that's the point. Should we be worried about Trump launching a missile? I think you know, President Trump's fascinating on, in many ways. Um, he, has, he has tweeted... Um, something like 250 times uh, more tweets than he's managed to pass legislation. So he makes quite a lot of noise. Um, the United States is a, you know, there are, there are checks and balances on, on presidential power. I know he wanders around with the biscuit, etc., but he doesn't have, have it. Trump is also rational. Um, whether he's a self-proclaimed genius, I don't know whether he's a genius. Um, but I don't think that, that that is a risk, but it's a real challenge for North America and her allies, what they do about, about North Korea, because the moment that he really does have an ICBM capability, um, then, then the, the whole thing is really shifted. I, th I think that the big button is a real risk, because the bigger the button, the more likely you are to lean on it. Right, um, accidentally. Accidentally knock yeah, it, yeah, yeah. put your coffee yeah. down on it. Yeah, you yeah. want a small button, I think. Um, uh, and I would like to point out that just because Americans the room does not mean Americans support him. Um, okay, last question, I think. Um, and I love the fact that we are throwing every country at you. Um, this is from Paul Jebley, I assume. Iranian demand for private aviation will be significant. But the question is when? When will Iran open up? It's a nice, easy one to end on. So um, Europe has got, well, less than now, 120 days to sort of sort out the Iran sanctions. I think that uh, the US administration will tighten sanctions on Iran. Um, I think it's a pretty easy um, thing to do. Again, 2018, we've got uh, elections in the US, I think, in terms of for, for this administration. They want to be following through on things they've talked about. So tightening sanctions on Iran, um, I think, is the obvious thing to do. The European Union uh, and others will not follow suit, but as, as you will know, 
uh, particularly in your sec sector, so much capital flows through the United States that I think you're going to find it uh, quite difficult for people to uh, finance those um, uh, jets that they want to buy. So I think Iran is still a slow burn. There are lots of internal tensions in Iran at the moment. I'll probably shut up because we could be on Iran for a while. <laughs> Any <laughs> final questions from the room? Um, I think the key thing to take away is that despite your worries, you've only managed to take the optimism down by six percentage points, right. uh, which is disappointing. We'll have to have you back <laughs> next year. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thank Pleasure you. Also.